Good morning. This is Monday, December 20th, 1999. Here at Natick, Massachusetts, this is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Program. This morning we are pleased to have with us again John Ray with tape number four. And just for a moment I'm going to bring us up to date as to what we have covered. Uh, John has talked to us about um, having been brought home in 1945 after serving in North Africa, Sicily and Europe, including the Battle of the Ardennes. Um, John, you told us last week that you had served in a variety of assignments after coming home. Um, one of the very important ones was getting married. Um, that as it was at the end of 1945, or it was in January of 46? Yes, that was in 46. Mm -hmm. All right. At and that time I was stationed in the Pentagon. All right, that's where we'll pick up this morning. You went to the Pentagon in October of 45. Uh, can you tell us what you did there, John? Our whole army was being reestablished, repositioned, reduced in size from way up around six or eight million men down to about two million. You can imagine the terrific effect upon every aspect of military service that came with that huge reduction from being the grandest army the world had ever seen, perhaps, uh, down to something more um, like a peacetime size of two million. Uh, Harry Truman was our president at that time, and uh, it was he who, of course, uh, directed that reduction, and necessarily so. But it was very, very difficult for us professional soldiers to, to uh, go through this whole huge exercise. In my own case, it had to do with <coughs> reduction of the Ordnance Corps uh, from its wartime strengths uh, down to what it was appropriate in this uh, would-be peacetime. You can realize, John and Barbara, uh, also that uh, the reduction uh, concerned not just personnel, but all of the equipment, supplies, the tanks, the aircraft, the ships of the Navy, all of these things had to be uh, reduced in uh, great measure. And it was really a, a terrible thing to, to observe in many respects what amounted to the, the destruction of a huge and competent force down to a manageable peacetime size. Everybody knew it was necessary, mind you, but it was very difficult to go through. Uh, late in this period, about the 1st of December of 1945, I was surprised to learn that the uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, the marvelous, wonderful General George Catlett Marshall, uh, had made a decision in favor of the old prisoners of war, which uh, applied, of course, in my case. Uh, which was that uh, a good many of us were promoted one grade uh, at that time, and maybe a few officers will have been promoted two grades uh, as a kind of, of a compensation for their having been in prison uh, for such a long time, and in anticipation that had they not been in prison, they would have earned a promotion in any event. I became, therefore, what I believe to have been the youngest colonel in the United States Army at age 27 and a half. That's very pleasant news, even at this great distance, John. So with a new bride, you took a train, I gather, <laughs> in those uh, To days. Niagara Falls, by golly. <laughs> to Niagara Falls. And went I'm over a sleeper. On the West Point, um, the United States Military Academy, you arrived in January of 46 and stayed till June of 50. Can you tell us what you did there? <clears throat> West Point, of course, uh, develops cadets into second lieutenants of the United States Army. That's the basic task that we're there for. My job was to teach law to the cadets of the senior class. A cadet, uh, as he uh, is later commissioned into the high responsibilities he will hold across the entire army, he must be familiar with uh, all aspects of law, at least in a lay sense. He must have uh, comprehension and, to some extent, uh, mastery of criminal law, uh, constitutional law, 
the laws of evidence, the laws of contracts, and of course military law in order they can perform his function in courts martial. And it was my great privilege to teach uh, the cadets of five different classes from 1946 up to 50 uh, what they needed to know about the law. This was a very satisfying experience for me and incidentally it allows me to have a, uh, a layman's degree of competency even in today about the fundamentals of the common law which is used to govern our country. I wasn't going to ask you this question until this morning, John, when you talk about the Corps uh, serving uh, at West Point. And I'm reminded of uh, Douglas MacArthur's last speech to the Corps of Cadets up there, which ended the Corps, the Corps, the Corps. I wonder if you can tell us about your feelings, having served thus far in your career so successfully in North Africa and Europe, your feelings about standing on that great parade ground. You're part of that tradition. <laughs> That's a big order, John, but uh, I'll try to uh, handle it in a thumbnail sketch. I, of course, had some associated with association with West Point, my father having been a graduate in the class of 1910. So as young myself, as age about 10, I was already uh, uh, sold on the Corps. In fact, believe it or not, when General MacArthur was superintendent, in 1920 or so, and I, merely about uh, four years old at the time, I was introduced to General MacArthur, then superintendent of the military academy, on the superintendent's front porch. <clears throat> but in any event, I was wholly dedicated to the, uh, the Corps of Cadets and the idea of West Point, which idea was originally implanted by President George Washington and our, the by the father of the military academy, uh, Colonel Sylvanus Thayer, from, for whom Thayer Academy mm -hmm. here in Massachusetts is today named. And uh, this uh, I thoroughly believe, I probably learned it from my father, but this is the finest educational institution in our world or in our country. And I'm very proud to have had the association for a total of uh, about 12 years of my life have been spent uh, on that campus and with the cadets. And I am wholly devoted to it. West Point provides the spirit, provides the heartbeat for makes the, which makes the United States Army what it is and what it has accomplished in the 200 years of our history. That's a very eloquent response, John. Thank you. Um, last week when we spoke with you, you said you were home in Massachusetts in uh, June of 1950 when you heard that the Korean War had broken out, the invasion of South Korea, and said to yourself, well, here we go again. Um, you went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma in January of that year, so you were... Um, in June of that year, I went to Fort Sill. Uh, I had finished my tour of duty at West Point teaching the class of 1950 cadets of the class of 1950. And when they graduated, uh, I too graduated, you might say, from the academy and went back into the mainstream of the Army. In this case, I did so by going to Fort Sill, Oklahoma in July of 1950. Incidentally, that class of 1950 became the class which lost the greatest number of members in the Korean War. They had just graduated as second lieutenants, and they, be, they became the, uh, uh, the front rank of the United States Army in Korea almost uh, within weeks after graduation. That would be a story in itself. Yes, it would. John, you stayed at Fort Sill until April of 51. What did you do there? There I was uh, simply a student officer in field artillery, tactics and techniques. This means, you see, John, that I had been uh, away from the artillery from about 1941 to 1940, well, to 1950. I had not really been performing the function of an artillery officer. As I told you earlier, uh, I had been providing the ammunition supply for the 1st United States Army and the 2nd United States Corps uh, in North Africa and in uh, Europe. And 
I was therefore very rusty about being an artilleryman. Then I went to teach law, and that is not very uh, artillery-based either. So I had to be refreshed and went uh, back for uh, nine or ten months of schooling at the artillery school to prepare me for the Korean War. From there you went to Fort Lewis, Washington in uh, April of 51? Yes, there I activated the 546th Field Artillery Battalion from scratch. A very interesting experience. We were armed with the 155 millimeter howitzer. That means about a six inch diameter shell. And <clears throat> the men of the 546th had just been either drafted or recruited into the army and uh, we created from these men the 546th Battalion with a strength of about 600 men. Uh, a good, goodly number of our officers and non-commissioned officers in that battalion were actually veterans of War II had been, who had been recalled to duty, not particularly according to their own wishes. So that raised some pretty tough uh, problems and situations which we solved. I'm not quite sure I understand. They, they're being recalled. Were they in the reserves, John? Uh, yes. I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're, the Army had been moving you slowly west as, as I look at the progression of the assignments you had. Uh -huh. uh, you're out on the west coast now in January of 52 and Korea is across the waters. I take it your next assignment was Korea. That's correct. I brought Tova, my wife, and the three little children right here to Natick, believe it or not, and we made it their home while I was serving in Korea. This was really my first introduction to Natick, was in December of 1951. And from here I left the family <coughs> uh, in Natick while I went to serve in Korea in the 9 Corps Artillery. That's IX-9, Roman 9, Corps Artillery. The Corps Artillery is, uh, you might think of it as being a brigade of artillery. And I was the second ranking officer in this brigade with title of Executive Officer, Nine Corps Artillery. And our job was to uh, provide artillery support to the infantry, uh, American infantry forces, and South Korean infantry forces uh, in the vicinity of the 8th parallel. Let's like to say here that by this time, you see, in uh, January of 52, the Korean War was 18 months old. The worst part was over. Also the best part, both the losingest and the winningest parts for America were both over by the time I got there. I feel it necessary to stress these points from day to day as we talk about what we do. I want to uh, remove any idea that I was any tough, rough infantryman in a foxhole. I was never that, and uh, uh, not in Korea. We were here to provide artillery support for the uh, American and South Korean infantry against the Chai Coms, that means Chinese Communists, and the North Korean Communist forces along the 38th parallel. And believe me, John, uh, the uh, uh, front lines today and the front lines nearly 50 years ago uh, are really unchanged. They're substantially the same today as they were about 50 years ago. So you arrived at Korea at the time of stalemate. Um, stalemate situation. Um, along the, the parallels yes. where it is today. Yes. Um, can you tell us the chain of command f over your head? Well, <clears throat> General Willard Wyman was the uh, commanding general of nine corps. And <laughs> you know, I think you're going to catch me with a short memory this morning. Uh, General uh, James Van Fleet uh, was the 8th Army commander, but I believe that he came in a little after I did to take the 8th Army. And my memory is not going to correct that this morning. But in any event, strictly in a, uh, like an organizational sense, the Corps Artillery was basic to the 9 Corps. The 9 Corps was one of three corps in 8th United States Army. We were spread across the entire Korean Peninsula, that is the 8th Army was, and it consisted roughly half, I think, of South Korean forces and American forces. I'd like to just say along this line, I never met so many young major generals in my life as I did in those days. 
when the South Korean major generals were younger than I was. And it really was an astonishing uh, uh, situation. We Americans, it was our duty to train the Korean forces even while they were fighting in the front lines. A really uh, quite an unusual and exciting experience. <coughs> One of my duties at times was to adjust the field artillery fire, uh, which fire was directed at Chai Kam forces, Chinese Communist forces, or North Korean forces. And uh, this being winter, real wintry uh, times there in the mountains of, uh, of Korea uh, in January of 52 and February and March, very wintry times. And uh, in order to do this field artillery observation, I sometimes uh, flew by helicopter over the Chinese Communist forces. On the day in question in February of 52, Major Los, L-O-O-S, uh, was my pilot on that day. I'm, uh, he's uh, <clears throat> piloting me in order that I can search for and observe the Chai Kam forces north of the 38th parallel. And when we would, when I would be able to sight these forces, I would be able to report them back to the gun positions and bring artillery fire to bear against them. On this day in February of uh, 52, all of a sudden, we found our helicopter went from an altitude of perhaps 300 feet above the ground to zero, that is, on the ground. I have never had quite such a memorable uh, uh, instant of life, I guess, when we found that here's Major Lose and me and our helicopter on the ground in communist North Korea. What in the world happens now? Well, what had happened is that Major Lowe's did not see a telephone wire, or possibly it was an electric power line, I'm not quite sure which. This got wrapped up in the rotor of our helicopter and the engines ceased and it dropped, as a helicopter will do, dropped like a stone, Jim, dropped like at, a plummet. At this point, can I ask you a question? Yes. You have twice been a prisoner of war that's true. When you hit the ground, did it go through your head? Here we go again. <laughs> that was about the feeling, John. Uh, except, you know, it's important. Uh, I don't know if I can ever convey uh, adequately, but one has to be positive and optimistic in life if he intends to uh, continue. And so I don't believe that we had any particular negative feelings. We knew that here we are on the ground, and we don't want to be on the ground here. We've got to move. And this is so, Major Lose uh, took from the, his belt uh, a knife and plier kit. Uh, as its name uh, suggests, this little leather kit has two tools in it, a uh, jackknife and a pair of pliers. And Major Lose says, uh, Colonel, well, which do you want, the knife or the plier? I said, uh, Lose, you, uh, you better take the one that you prefer because you are professional and will get the best use out of it. I'm non-professional in knife and plier kits and winding around the rotors, uh, so you give me the second choice. Whereupon, Los and I took these two tools and we worked on what may have been, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 or more uh, uh, rounds of uh, copper wire wrapped around our rotor, keeping it from running and we took these tools and removed the wires and in a surprisingly short time, let's say 10 minutes, maybe 15, in the woods up here in the forest, in the mountains, in North Korea land, we're both uh, removing this wire and Lowe's responds, I'm going to try her out, Colonel. And with this, uh, we put away our tools. I climbed into the seat beside him. He got in the pilot's seat and he revved up the motor and we were back in business. And I said, uh, well, let's go. He said, I'm sorry, there is a regulation in the United States Army that I cannot carry passengers after having uh, uh, such an accident as we have had. Uh, therefore, uh, it'll be necessary for you to stay here. I said, no way, Jose. <laughs> Whereupon, 
we took off, and within no more than 10 minutes, we were back in nine core artillery. So you broke a regulation of the United States Army. <laughs> we did do that. I didn't do it often, but when needed, I did. Darn right. <laughs> on the following day, Major Lowe's, his helicopter was not operating. And on the following day, I'm back to my paperwork duties, if you want to call it that, at the artillery headquarters. Major Lowe's flew over the same uh, uh, country again in a fixed wing small aircraft, and Major Lowe's has never been seen or heard from again. We searched uh, using uh, aerial maps, uh, uh, current aerial maps at the time. We searched all over the reasonable area of North Korea, and we could not find anything except a hole in the ice in a lake, which possibly is where Major Lowe's uh, went to his grave. Is, I do not is know. he today still listed as MIA? I'm sorry? Is he still listed today as MIA? I don't know the answer to that. I cannot answer that. Hmm. That's, that's a very uh, sad story. I have in my notes, Tokyo and Yokohama, Far East yes. Command. <clears throat> Soon after these events I've just described, I suffered ear trouble in, uh, uh, in Korea. This was a recurrence of ear troubles that had first begun in Sicily about uh, nine years previous, in 1950, uh, 1943. And I was uh, hospital evacuated from Korea to uh, Tokyo. And uh, this was reason to terminate my assignment in Korea. So I was only there for about four months, I think it was, and I was, uh, at this time, in the spring of 1952, was transferred to uh, headquarters of the Far East Command. That's the headquarters that had been General MacArthur's headquarters for the previous eight or ten years, and uh, MacArthur had been removed, as you know, by President Truman from his assignment, and Mark Wayne Clark was the new commander uh, of uh, headquarters Far East Command. I was assigned to the uh, G3 section, that means the plans and operations section of Far East Command at that time. What did you do in that capacity? In that capacity, my duties uh, uh, pertain to the future planning and operations anywhere in the Far East, which would mean from, let us say, uh, the entire Korean area, Okinawa, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and on down into the Philippines or uh, over into uh, Southeast Asia. Whatever military events might come up would be the business of headquarters Far East. And my responsibilities under supervision from higher ranking officers was, uh, had to do with the plans and operations. Now before going to Korea, I had attended nuclear weapons school atomic weapons school, and thus was considered to be some kind of expert in atomic weapons. That was actually a, uh, a, an improper designation of this amateur person who as of today knows very little about it and didn't know a great deal about it then. But it would be true to say he knew more than most people did about this gross subject of atomic weapons. Considering so, that training, John, did you have an opportunity to go to Hiroshima or Nagasaki? Uh, never. Never to either of those places. No. Uh, happens that most of the uh, atomic weapon, weapons plans which I worked on had to do with the possible usage of such weapons under very dire conditions that conceivably might come up in connection with the Korean War. Some folks don't understand that uh, our Army, also Navy and Air Force, must have plans for every eventuality. It does not mean that the plans are necessarily ever executed. But in this case, I had, along with certain Naval officers and Air Force officers, I had the responsibility to develop plans in case we had to use nuclear weapons uh, in Korea or elsewhere in the Far East. It's a pretty uh, uh, daunting thought to uh, consider all of this. Uh, it also was a very uh, exciting and uh, 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 highly responsible 
uh, kind of assignment. I worked with Commander Mike, uh, Carmichael of the U.S. Navy on these matters, and Carmichael uh, arranged to take me aboard the uh, carrier, the USS Oriskany, off the shores of Korea, so that we could have dry runs or practice runs of what might happen if we had to employ naval aircraft from an aircraft carrier to attack in northern Korea. It sounds pretty horrible that we even had such plans, but in this short uh, uh, discussion of the subject today, I'd like to just leave it there that we had the plan, but fortunately never had to use them. Mm -hmm. Had Matthew Ridgway arrived uh, or come and gone by this time? Uh, yes, I think he had. And for some reason, John, this morning, I'm not going to be able to pull out all those <laughs> names in proper order. There's just one more very uh, distinct, distinguished uh, U.S. Army officer, as you probably know, yes, who uh, certainly uh, uh, did fine things in uh, uh, his long career in the Army. This is going to seem like an abrupt jump here, but the next note I have is Tulane University. Can you when tell I us from my, that? finish my two-year tour. Incidentally, I must not leave out here that uh, during the two years in Tokyo, which later was Yokohama, I brought Tova, my wife, and the three little children <coughs> whom she brought kind of on uh, leashes uh, from Natick to Tokyo. And they got to live there for about two years. The, the children at that time were ages, uh, I guess, five, three, and one. And uh, this was a great part of uh, the children's development to uh, live there, and also Tova's and mine. We were living in uh, private housing at terrific expense in rent out of my pocket. <coughs> the rental costs equaled the, my monthly salary. We couldn't keep that up for very long, and fortunately, the Army was able to provide us uh, adequate quarters after a while. And this was a marvelous period of family development along with other things. John, but, this, this is only seven years after the end of the war. That what is did, true. What did Tokyo look like in those days? Tokyo was a very, uh, I would say, uh, recovered place. There was still uh, some uh, bomb damage and all that was evident, but I think we had a very, uh, uh, considering everything, quite a serene life there. We got along uh, very well with the Japanese people including a Japanese maid that we had. I wrote to my parents and said, well, tsuneko san has now changed a thousand diapers and uh, done all this laundry for us and taken care of us, and it was a, a, a really marvelous experience. I'm going to take this opportunity to say to you, John, that uh, uh, the, my whole 33 years in the Army was just loaded with marvelous experiences in many different parts of the world. I gather that, and there's more to come. Um, what did you do at Tulane University? This is June of 54, I have. <laughs> June, June of 50, probably uh, June of 52 to about April of 54, am I? No, I'm sorry, June, I have 54 of, June of 56. 50, June of 54, uh, into, for about two years, into mm -hmm. 1956. <coughs> Here the Army sent me to Tulane University, a very fine uh, uh, university in New Orleans, to study psychology. Probably could sound a little bit peculiar that the artillery officer who uh, provided the munitions to the forces in War II and who was uh, knocked down in a helicopter in uh, uh, Korea would now be studying psychology. But I think that the world should know, and the citizens of Natick should know, that our United States Army is really an organization of people. That's the main thing is, it's people. In our army, the weapons are, dare I say, sort of an attachment or an extension for the people. And the whole guts and the essence of the institution which our army is, and of which I am so proud, is people. In those days, it was almost all men, with the exception of nurses and physical therapists and dietitians and such, it was almost all men. Today, of course, it is women as well. And the Army is a people organization, and so our Army, 
must know as much as, I, as we can about how people operate, what they do, what they can do, what they cannot do, what they ought not do, what they should do, and everything from discipline and uh, uh, educational uh, uh, requirements of psychology, all this stuff is our business. And if we're going to have the fine army that we have, we must make plot proper applications of psychology. So this you're building up to human I, resources, aren't you? Pardon me? You're building up to a human resources. Exactly, aspect. exactly. My assignment after I finished at Tulane University with master's degree in psychology was to take charge of <coughs> the application of psychology uh, uh, within the service by developing laboratory experiments, human laboratory experiments, which would be devised for the purpose of improving educational techniques, disciplinary needs, possibly such things uh, applicable today more now than then, which would be relationships between the sexes in the army surely the racial relationships within the army, all of these things have uh, psychological implications. And to the extent that psychology is a positive force in our, uh, in our life in America, so too psychology can help give us a better army. John, you just touched on the phrase uh, racial relationships. Yes. Um, can you tell us about your experiences and your preparation for that in the United States Army. Well, right. Here we're going to get into matters that uh, <coughs> are of huge importance to uh, uh, everybody, to all America. I think there's possibly no uh, larger challenge to America today than to have uh, excellent relations between the races. <coughs> this is for today and for the new century. But I'd like to just give a few examples of things that we've been through during the uh, 33 years of my service that, uh, that uh, might throw some light on all of this. We go back to the days in North Africa and in Europe where my responsibility was to uh, supply and deliver munitions to all of the different army forces throughout the whole theater of operations, or at least the two corps and first army areas of operation. In both cases, <coughs> I employed ammunition companies. This would be uh, approximately 150 men makes up an ammunition company. These men were, uh, to some extent, you might say, excellent uh, uh, experienced uh, supply handlers who must be able to understand the safety aspects of uh, uh, the very dangerous things which are the munitions of our army. <coughs> My point here is that in both cases, North Africa and in Europe, about half of my uh, ordnance ammunition troops were Negro units, black units. In those days, this is the 1940s, in those days the black soldiers were organized in companies separate from white soldiers. People learn of this today and they think how horrible and re regrettable it is and the people who are critical of it, uh, there's much right on their side. I can only say this was a long established practice within the military services. I'm going to stick to army on the subject. I won't get into navy on the subject <coughs> or air force, but in any event we had, I had at my command, at, at my, I had the staff responsibility for some hundreds of uh, black soldiers uh, across Europe handling our munitions and they did just as good a job as did the white soldiers in similar companies. These black, black companies were commanded uh, by white officers and the battalions in which the companies were assigned uh, contained, the battalions contained both black companies and white companies. And all of the companies did an outstanding job for America. The soldiers concerned, 
the black soldier's concerned, uh, I believe, uh, I think we uh, took care of them uh, equally well as we did the white soldiers, as re respects their food, their behavior problems, their uh, uh, whatever little entertainment or USO uh, kind of provision we could make for them. I think we did a pretty good job of, of dealing with these black companies and white companies in similar fashion. And I think that the companies of men, mind you, a company I have in mind is about 150 men. The 150 black men in a black company, the 150 white men in a similar white company were working side by side in many cases, were cooperative and respectful of one another, and I was very proud. In fact, I never myself uh, challenged the uh, separate but equal, if you will, situation that we were running. Mm -hmm. It certainly was not in my power to change all that and shake it all up and make pepper and salt of it at that time. Well, we all saw this as, well, that's how the Army is, and uh, we didn't even challenge it. Now, when we got into later uh, experiences, <coughs> for example, uh, when I was commanding the Nike forces, well, see, I'm, we'll get to I'm getting ahead of myself. John, uh, can we stop there just a second? Yes, yes. Uh, the Supreme Court eventually decided separate and equal are not equal. Yeah. And President Truman decided to integrate the armed forces much further along than you speak yes. of in the 40s. Could you tell us the differences you might have observed at that time? <coughs> Gee whiz. Uh, I'm not sure how well I can handle this on such short notice. <laughs> I, I, I don't like to deal with a question that is as important as it and not be quite ready for it. And uh, I should be ready if I contemplate for a while. I'll, I'll come out with a, uh, I, I think. A no, I, I agree with you. This is something that uh, is, uh, would be very, uh, takes a great deal of time. Um, I'd like to get on to as well to uh, uh, an assignment that I, you talked about several weeks ago. And I've been waiting to ask you about what did you do in New York in June 60 to September 61? After I'd finished at Fort Monroe, Virginia with the human resources assignment, which I made brief reference to earlier, uh, and which was like laboratory type of testing of new methods and procedures to make our Army run better. When I finished that four-year assignment at Fort Monroe, I went to Staten Island, New York, where I became commanding officer of the uh, 80th Field Artillery Group. <coughs> this 80th Field Artillery Group, for group, you may read regiment if you like, it has a similar meaning, means that there were about 2,500 soldiers uh, stationed in a great circle around uh, New York City with the center of the circle being at uh, Washington Square, New York. So it ran out into New Jersey and Long Island and on up the river even to include West Point. And <clears throat> here we had the, uh, the 52nd Artillery Brigade had 25 missile sites, that is locations for Ni Nike missiles. About a little more than half of these sites were in the 80th Artillery Group and were my responsibility. Now, our weapon was the Nike missile. N-I-K-E, like the sneakers that kids are wearing these days. This is the Nike missile. And our job was to defend the city of New York against invaders from anywhere. Here, I guess you may read Soviet in the, in the uh, 1950s, which is when, uh, when I was there. And I had about, uh, I think, about 15 missile sites in the well-known towns and villages of northern Jersey and uh, 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 southern New York and along the Hudson River out into, Los, uh, into Long Island. These missile sites, each of these had about 90 soldiers located upon it with their dependent families. We defended New York with missiles, which were uh, about half of them were ato atomic weapon capable, and the other half were high explosive weapon capable. 
Our purpose, I guess, was to defend the city of New York from any foreign invader, as I have said, for which I must read Soviet at that time. Would, this, would these weapons have been used against aircraft or shipping? They're, they're for use against aircraft, solely for the use against aircraft. Mm -hmm. And here, this soldier who had begun in 1939 in horse-drawn artillery was now commanding the artillery mm -hmm. uh, uh, anti-air missile defense of the city of New, New York, where he had grown up only a few miles away from there. <laughs> it was a little hard to imagine. And my children, of course, and my wife were with me there, as they have been uh, throughout all those years since 1946. They were all in the public schools of New York City at that time. I'm going to be very vague here about a date, but uh, perhaps you can help me. When did the Cuban Missile Crisis develop? That was during the Kennedy administration. John Kennedy became president in 1961. I think that must have been in 62. So that is coterminous with... Um, well, you're very close, John. Uh, I left that assignment after two years, which means I left in 61. Because lo and behold, as I sat at Fort Wadsworth on Staten Island, New York, one morning, I received a call from the Pentagon in 1961. And here was the message. Colonel, you have been designated to be the military attache in the American Embassy in Rangoon, Burma. This is the only assignment you have ever received or will ever receive in which you have the option of refusal. You have 24 hours to inform us in the Pentagon uh, whether you accept or reject this assignment. I telephoned Tova, who was at our home only a few, hard, few hundred yards away in Fort Wadsworth, New York, and I gave her the same message which the Pentagon had given me. And I've said, honey, That's your I've wife. taken you <laughs> to my wife. Yes. I said, I've taken you and the family to all these different places in Tokyo, Yokohama, New Orleans, Virginia, <coughs> and now Staten Island and West Point where the kids were born and all of that. And now we're being invited to go to Rangoon, Burma. And I'm passing the decision to you because I, you've not been given any decision opportunity in the past, and now I think it is your decision whether we accept or not. And Tova responded, well, we have both served for more than three years in Europe in time of war. Why can we not go back to Europe uh, instead of to uh, Burma, to Asia, uh, now that the war is over? I said, sweetheart, that's not for us to decide. I cannot tell you why, but it's your decision whether we go to Burma or not. We finished that little phone call. I gave her 24 hours to respond, <laughs> and 15 <laughs> minutes later, she telephoned me back at my headquarters, and she said, we are going. She had looked into the encyclopedia, learned what she could about the Buddhist country of Burma, whose culture is at a 13th century level of uh, progress. She had studied this in the encyclopedia for 15 minutes and she advised me, yes, we are going. So we went, but we could not go immediately. I had to take one year of Burma army, excuse me, of Burma language study to study and presumably master the Burmese language. You did that in, in Monterey, I take it? In Monterey, California, yeah. correct. By this time, you see, in 1962, I was, uh, I mean, 19... June of 62. 62. Yeah. Yeah, I was then 43 years old. And to learn the Burmese language at age 43 is a challenge that, uh, as far as I know, nobody has ever succeeded with, including this one. Try as hard as he did. I still became uh, uh, known as the most fluent <laughs> American in the Burmese language. And 
Tova volunteered that she too would study the Burmese language with me. By this time the kids were in junior high school or high school so she had enough free time that she could go to class and sit beside me every day in this class with our Burmese language teachers of whom we had five Burmese natives teaching about 10 American students. <clears throat> they were all enlisted people except for uh, me and uh, my wife and one other officer who was also headed for Burma. Well, this really was an experience trying to learn that language as best we could. And we made only, uh, uh, I would have to say, rather primitive efforts or success anyway in uh, handling that language. And uh, so after a, nearly a full year of uh, studying this, dare I say, awful thing, although I've come to love it in the years since, <coughs> we packed up the family. <coughs> Mind you, by then they're at Monterey, California. The kids are in the California sc schools. Now they've left Staten Island. They're in the Monterey school. <coughs> now we have to go. To, now it's time to go to Burma. I arranged that we could, could go aboard the steamship Lurleen from San Francisco as far as Honolulu. There we got 10 days Honolulu vacation <coughs> before we proceeded and then moved all the family together. Next was to Manila. <coughs> I had arranged with the Pentagon. It was uh, important that I be uh, permitted to visit in the other Southeast Asian countries before Burma in order that I would become acclimated. After all, mm -hmm. at this stage of my life, I had not learned much about those areas. <coughs> and so I would uh, go to the uh, American embassies uh, in all of these other different countries uh, on my way to Burma so that I could get acquainted with my fellow diplomats in these uh, other countries. All right, John, a question here. Yeah? You're a full colonel yeah. with a great deal of experience, yeah. uh, a great deal of experience in the Army and in around the world. Why did the Army send you to Burma in 1964, 62? What was going on in the world that they foresaw a need for a man of your capabilities to be there. <laughs> well, your questions are very good, John. <clears throat> American embassies worldwide, at least in the, depending upon the significance <coughs> of the nation concern, uh, that is of the host nation, American embassies have U.S. military representation within each embassy. This is so that the ambassador has a degree of military competency at his hand to, so that he can carry out his function. Our embassies will go all the way from the uh, largest and perhaps most significant ones, let us say in London or in Moscow or in Paris or Rome or, uh, or uh, Tel Aviv or wherever it may be, down to the less familiar countries of which Burma would <coughs> either then or today would be uh, probably less significant. At that time but it was pretty obscure, but I have the feeling the <coughs> army knew something. <coughs> well, that's true. But uh, I want to impress upon you that ambassadors, American ambassadors worldwide require military advice and counsel in order to carry on their own function. And this is I would say one of the three purposes of military attaches. One is to advise the ambassador. Secondly is to represent the United States Army or Navy as the case may be to their opposite numbers in that country, particularly if it's a friendly country. But even if it's not a friendly country such as uh, maybe Moscow in those days, we still have a, a fairly substantial U.S. military representation in the embassy in order that the uh, countries, the, whether uh, friendly or not friendly, uh, can, can have a reasonable understanding of each other's policies and other things. 
Please don't mistake me. If we were at war with another company, we would not have an, another country. We would not have an embassy. But in peacetime, we need to have a kind of uh, relationship, which I think the American citizens would appreciate today that we are so represented. So that, uh, <coughs> let's take in the more extreme case, like say Moscow, it's so that we will not be surprised, our president and Russia's president will not be surprised by what's going on. A certain exchange of uh, information between the countries concerned is very important. Do you happen to know, John, if there's um, an embassy staff in Burma? Well, it's Myanmar uh, today. <coughs> you know, I'm not quite up to date about that right now, uh, John. And now you're you're going to open more subjects that I uh, uh, that thrill me to uh, uh, think about and to discuss about a little bit. Before I get to that point, I'd like to mention one other uh, matter that does come to mind. The military attaché reports back to the Pentagon every day of his life while he's out there everything of military significance in the host country that the Pentagon ought to know and by military significance we go to everything from the conditions and circumstances in a military hospital or the highways on the road or the strength or the competency, the training of the Burma army or whatever is the host army. All of this stuff is my business to inform the Pentagon about. Now this is all done in an overt way, meaning an open way. We are not spies. We are not stealing secrets. We are not hiding behind this and that to get the information. It's all above board and we do it with the permission of the government concerned. Now you have advanced the calendar by about 30 years or 35 years since I was there, and you have noted that the name of Burma has been changed to Myanmar, mispronounced all over the As uh, I just press did. and so forth. <laughs> Myanmar, actually, it is the ancient name of Burma that go, would go back uh, two or more centuries, which has been uh, uh, rejuvenated, let us say, by the present communist militarist, ugly regime in Burma today has brought back this name. I doubt that today we better get too far into this thing, but I do want to say <coughs> uh, how important it is for American people to understand the significance of Burma today. Burma today is certainly a target for communist China as an outlet for China to have to the Indian Ocean. I feel, this is John Ray speaking, I feel I'm not giving any formal kind of information that is government property. It's John Ray's feeling that Burma is a target of Chinese com uh, communists today. Burma is also a terrible dictatorship today. The people of Burma in the year approximately 1991 elected to be their leader, their president, a woman called Aung San Suu Kyi one of the finest, most heroic women or persons in this world today now is Aung San arrest. Suu Kyi. She is a Nobel Peace, uh, Peace Prize winner, if I have the, if my memory is not playing tricks on me. She is an educated person. She is a fine person, uh, aged probably about 55. She has spent a goodly part of the last nine years in house arrest in her home country. When she was called upon to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, she got her husband, who has recently died incidentally, got her husband to go to, uh, I guess it would be <coughs> Norway, to receive that prize because uh, she herself dared not to leave her country, meaning to leave her countrymen. I still have hopes, I hope that my hopes will not be dashed, that someday Aung San Suu Kyi, the daughter of Burma's great military hero of 50 years ago. Her father's name was Aung San. <coughs> and his daughter Aung San Suu Kyi is entitled to be president of that country. And if she ever can regain the presidency from her house situation, I promise that the beautiful country of Burma will be brought back to where it should be in our world. Today it is a disaster in every form that I can imagine. It is really a terrible place today. Tell us, John, about uh, your family being there. 
you and your wife, and uh, when you first went yeah. uh, to this totally tropical yeah. country, what was it like to go to Burma? The year was 1962. <coughs> A person called General Ne Win had recently, at that time in 1962, five months before my arrival in October of 62, Ne Win. Uh, a militarist Marxist dictator had overthrown the elected government of Burma at that time and uh, he was full-fledged dictator of his country when I went there. <coughs> However, this did not spoil for the Ray family the marvelous life we had in his country for two years. Don't mistake me, it did throw a lot of cold water on many aspects of it, but it did not take away the beauty of this beautiful subtropical uh, country, which uh, lies between uh, Thailand to the east and India to the west. A wonderful uh, country with the Iver Irrawaddy River flowing from northern Michina down through Mandalay and down to Rangoon. And <clears throat> at the time, the population was 26 million people. Uh, it, when I was there uh, for 30 five years ago. Today I'm told it's up around 45 million, almost a doubling in that period. <coughs> we had a very nice uh, embassy residence, uh, possibly the most palatial home that I have ever uh, occupied with my family. The children at the time when they got there in 1942, Martin was age 16, Carolyn was 14, Joel was 11, and uh, we had them all in public schools, which we ourselves, I call it public because maybe erroneously, they were not Burmese schools. These kids were in uh, schools which we embassy folks from all of the uh, uh, foreign embassies in mm -hmm. Rangoon got together and created schools for the children. So Joel at age 11 was in a class with children from Japan, Israel, India, England, uh, I won't try to name all of the countries, but there he was at age 11 in with this little United Nations of the uh, sixth or seventh grade. From a professional point of view, John, what were you telling the Pentagon was going on in those days? <coughs> I think the most significant things I would try to inform the Pentagon was my own judgment as to the condition of the Burma Army, its state of training, its competency, its ability to perform its functions. And this was very difficult because many of its functions uh, had to do with uh, the uh, repression of uh, the civilian citizenry uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of these topics are too large for me to try to, to try to, I don't have any secrets really about the matter, but I, I would have visitors come to my home, uh, sometimes uninvited, usually uninvited. They would ask for an appointment to visit me in my home or in other times in my office in the embassy. And they would ask what I could do to arm the civilians to, uh, in order that they would would be able to perform their uh, uh, aggressive activities against the Burma army. These would be the kinds of problems that I would be faced with. And I, uh, I want to stress uh, my activities were overt, they were not covert, and I simply had to explain to these people that America was not arming insurgents, that was not our business. I would, of course, report the fact of these meetings back to the Pentagon so that they would understand what was going on. <coughs> I, I would visit and uh, inspect the hospitals of the Burma Army so that I could report back my judgment of the uh, competency of those hospitals. I would report the locations of the small elements of the Burma Army all over the country. I would sometimes report back, uh, in fun at least, that in the knapsack uh, that Napoleon had uh, told the world uh, many years before that in the knapsack of all private soldiers is the baton of the field marshal, Napoleon said. I said, but in Burma, in the knapsack of all private soldiers is the loan G or the dress 
that is uh, appropriate for civilian wear so that the soldier can turn into an insurgent overnight just by changing his clothes. That's an important piece of information. Yes. John, how long were you in Burma? Two years. And where did you go from there? <clears throat> from there I went to Rochester, New York, where I took command of the northern New York sector of the United States Army Reserves. This was my first reserve force uh, experience in my military life. And uh, <clears throat> so for a period of four years in upstate New York, I was responsible to <clears throat> train and uh, take care, care of, in all respect, the Army Reserve forces all over the great area, which is the upstate New York, thus not to include uh, uh, Manhattan and New York and Westchester County and Long Island. Those places were not within my purview, but everything north of there within the state of New York was my business. For four years? Yeah. This brings us up to 68? 68 and my retirement at age 50. You retired from the Army now? Yes, having been in since 1935. And your last day was? Colonel. Uh, the last, where were you on the, your last day in the regular Army? Where were you retired from? I see. Uh, <laughs> I think it was Fort Wadsworth, New York, which was the next higher headquarters above me. You have spoken to me over the last few weeks of um, many people who made a great impression on you. And we're going to, in the time that we have left here, uh, get down the list that you have given me. And if you could tell us something about why they're uh, important to your memory bank and why we should know about it from a historical point of view. And the first name I have on the list is Strom Thurmond. Now the senior senator from South Carolina. <clears throat> if it doesn't bother you, John, I'd like to just change the order and make Strom the second person we'll report about. Because there's one person who stands above all in my experience. This is General Omar Bradley, General, General Omar Nelson Bradley, who was my uh, uh, commanding general in two corps, in Sicily, in Normandy, but even before all that, way back when I was a cadet, a 17-year-old plebe, and he was my commanding officer when he was Major Bradley. And I would just like to cite this one person above all the rest who in all my years I feel uh, was the most distinguished influence upon my whole life. The only person I place ahead of this is my own father, Martin Ray. Omar Bradley was an infantryman, West Point class of 1915. It's been said that's the class the stars fell on. That's the class also of Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower and it's the class also of James Van Fleet and many more distinguished people that I should mention. And I simply had the great good fortune of uh, uh, being a part of General Bradley's army and, dare I say, of General Bradley's life for the most important years of that life and of my life. And this man <coughs> uh, should be known first as a field soldier who, know the, who knew the business of military tactics, yes, but most important, he knew the men of the U.S. Army and what was their, uh, their need and their personality, their capability and their uh, willingness, their loyalty, all the finest qual qualities that we attached to the, uh, uh, the best of the U.S. Army. Uh, uh, these were the, the qualities and the characteristics borne by Omar Bradley and which he in turn taught to his uh, officers and his men right down to the lowest ranking infantry private. They came to know this wonderful distinguished man, Omar Bradley. <coughs> I had first encountered him at age 17. I'm going to take a moment for that particular encounter. The first time I ever saw this man, 
I weighed 107 pounds. I was about the smallest cadet as well as the youngest cadet in the class of 39. We were on the parade ground you have mentioned this morning, having our first uh, field inspection, having pitched our pup tents, uh, shelter tents, they were more officially called, and spread out our field equipment to show that we who had been cadets for about one week at that time, in my case, age 17, that we were becoming a soldier for the first time in our life. And the king of the beasts, so-called, was Major Bradley. That meant he was responsible for breaking in this new class in Beast Barracks. And Major Bradley came down the line of these tents, and he stopped in front of my little tent, little tent this high, little pup tent, and he said, who are you, man? And I said, I'm New Cadet Ray, sir. And Major Bradley responded, where is your shaving brush? And I responded, sir, I use brushless shaving cream. That was the, my way of responding, really, which, the, which was the absolute truth, is I don't even shave yet. That's really what I was saying. <laughs> and Brad understood that right off the bat. And he responded, men use lather. <laughs> and from that time until in that very same area, in the year 1980, long after this uh, as whole story that we have covered together. In 1980, I was called back to West Point by my father's classmates in 1910 to please be present. Two of his classmates were still surviving in the class of 10, and I was asked to escort those two men at their alumni parade for the 70th anniversary of their graduate graduation. My father was deceased by that time. So I attended the 1910 reunion, took care of the old graduates uh, who were about 92 years old who were attending that graduation. I then went down to the Thayer Hotel because I knew that the class of 1915 would be having its 65th reunion. And I was so desirous of calling upon Brad, my general. I went into the Thayer Hotel and very quickly at this uh, class dinner function which the class of 15 was holding, I quickly found Brad in a wheelchair with Mrs. Bradley uh, responsible for managing the wheelchair for him. <coughs> Not intending to be doing anything uh, of a necessarily religious nature, I got down on my knee before Brad in his wheelchair. It was just convenient to do it this way. And I welcomed him back to West Point. And Brad looked at me. At the time, he was about 89, I think, years old. He looked at me and he said, John, what are you doing here? Why are you not in prison camp? <laughs> I thought he would ask you where your shaving brush was. <laughs> I said, General, I've had other things to do. <laughs> and I said, Sir, I would like to ask you a question. How does the world look? This is 1980. I said, General, how does the world look? And Brad said, We may have to put the team back together. And that was my last visit with my beloved, wonderful friend. That sounds like a very good story, and I think it's, uh, I'm so glad you've told us that today, because I, is it written down any place else for people ever to read it? That's, Not my story, no. That's great. These names that you've given me, I have assigned no pr priority to them, yes. and I didn't mean to uh, put Strom Thurman. Should we go to Strom next? Yeah. <clears throat> Strom was a staff officer for Brad, uh, as I was, in Bristol, England in 1943. This is uh, just to fit it into the context here. We were recently back from Sicily. We had reformed the First Army staff. <clears throat> it was to take command uh, in due course, uh, seven or eight months later, of the Normandy Beach forces. A month uh, ahead of the time I'm about to tell about, I was in the palace with King George VI. And lo and behold, 
in Bristol, England at a little uh, uh, girls' college called Clifton College in Bristol where the First Army had taken over the dormitories of Clifton College as our headquarters momentarily. And lo and behold, uh, in this uh, little uh, dormitory, uh, Strum Thurman and a few uh, of my other North African fellows uh, we were together as though we were like roommates in there for a period of a couple of months. And I had the wonderful opportunity to get, a, to get acquainted with Strum Thurman. Uh, just to remind the, the uh, uh, viewers about this, uh, Strum in this year of 1999, last week, celebrated, I believe it's his 97th birthday, uh, the oldest senator in the United States Senate. And we became friends at that time. In fact, in Bristol, England, uh, we North African pals, uh, Strum had not been in Africa, mind you. He had come from Governor's Island, New York. We elected Strum Thurman the governor of South Carolina. This was just uh, a little joke that we did. And lo and behold, when the war was over a, a couple of years later, the people of South Carolina verified our decision <laughs> that he should become governor, and they elected him. But in the meantime, in the 82nd Airborne Division, commanded by Matthew Ridgway at that time, whom you have mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. John, a moment ago, in the 82nd Division, the staff judge advocate of that division broke his leg in a practice parachute jump. And General Ridgway needed a new staff judge advocate uh, because uh, this would have been maybe January, no, probably about March of 1944. His, his staff judge advocate had a broken leg, therefore he needed a replacement. And Strum Thurman volunteered to go from General Bradley's Army staff to the division staff of the Airborne Division to become staff judge advocate for uh, General Ridgway. We all wished uh, Strum well as he was about to become a paratrooper at age 40. He was older, by the, older than the rest of us by uh, 17 or 18 years. And uh, turned out he did not become a paratrooper. Instead, he became a glider uh, soldier. And when I met Strom Thurman on Normandy Beach, possibly about D-Day plus 10, something like that, might have been D-Day plus 8, I had lunch with Strom on the beach of, uh, of Normandy. And I said, Strom, how was it coming into uh, Normandy Beach by glider? And John, he responded, here you come flying in on that, at night in the dark, and lo and behold, bang, the right wing fell off. Go a few more seconds, and the left wing fell off. The Germans had put like telephone poles in the open fields, which our gliders would be using to land on. The Germans had apparently anticipated something like that, but they put up the poles, and the, uh, uh, the uh, wings were uh, broken off by the gliders hitting the poles. And so he said, so the right wing fell off, the left wing fell off, and the next thing, John, I find myself sitting out in the field all by myself. The whole aircraft, uh, that is glider, which was made almost like orange crates, we used to say, the glider had fallen apart, and there is Strum, age 40, Staff Judge Advocate of the 82nd Division, Airborne Division. That's a rough uh, landing, Sitting isn't out it? there by himself. I've seen Strum a number of times since then. I, we we uh, exchange uh, uh, birthday and anniversary congratulations and things from time to time. I just want to add, because we've also talked about race relations, and you can't talk about Strum Thurman without talking about race relations. I have become convinced in the 50 years that I have known Strum Thurman, I have become convinced that he is one of the great benefactors of the black Americans, uh, particularly in the state of South Carolina, and that where the press has given him a hard time and uh, they overemphasize the word Dixiecrat and things like that, I think the press is, uh, is uh, 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 conveying a wrong idea uh, to the American people about one of the great citizens of our time. John, we, um, we have limited time left. I'm, I'm going to pick out names here that uh, I am most familiar with, and one of them is Frank Borman. Now, John, you're, you're back to some of the cadets in the class of 1946 to 50. 
and it's been fun for me in the ensuing 50 or more years uh, since these cadets were my cadets, since they were my students and I was their teacher. I have uh, had the opportunity to watch uh, some of the more prominent ones as they've grown into world fame. Now Frank Borman would certainly be one of those. Not only was he either first or second ranking cadet in his class in academics, class of 1950, but in addition, as the world knows, he has become a very important astronaut who was the first one, I believe, to circle the moon. Christmas Eve. He, he later became president of Eastern Airlines. He has been on the television even within recent weeks as a strong uh, supporter of NASA and the entire space program. I'm very proud to have had Frank as one of my students. I knew him quite well as a cadet. I knew him better than I knew most other cadets. Once he even had the privilege of, uh, of driving Frank Borman when he was manager of the cadet football team. He himself was a cadet. I drove him back up to West Point after, after the game, uh, taking him home. And uh, I think uh, very highly of Frank uh, today. Another of my uh, important students in those days was Al Haig. Alexander Haig, who became Secretary of State of the United States, uh, as you know, under the Nixon uh, administration, I guess, and maybe Bush, I won't remember at all, but Al Haig was one of my students. Uh, whether any of our uh, instruction was helpful to him or conceivably harmful to him, I'll have to leave that to <laughs> history other than me to answer. Another was Fidel Ramos, who is today still a president of the Philippine Republic. I think he's held that office for five or six years. And uh, although I did not know uh, Ramos uh, too terribly well, I know full well that he's a better president of the Philippines for his having been a cadet at West Point. I have a, a Roosevelt on my list. Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. Uh, oh, have we not talked about him no, up sir? to now? Wow. Well, <laughs> This is t uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Jr., uh, son of President Theodore Roosevelt. To help people with their calendars, President Theodore Roosevelt was born, I think, in 1960, uh, 1860, I mean to say, and uh, he died in 1919. That would be the lifespan of Theodore Roosevelt. This Teddy Roosevelt was his son, born, I believe, in 1888, a veteran of War One. And when I first met Teddy Roosevelt, Jr., it was happened, we were both taking a shower together in a tent-like shower on Louisiana Maneuvers in 1941, at which time he would have been about uh, uh, 53 years old, I guess, and I 23. And it just happened we were, uh, you might say, we became intimately acquainted uh, in the shower there without a stitch of clothes on. I never saw any human body with as much serious old wounds I saw on the body of Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. at that time. All the large muscles of his biceps and his shoulder muscle and so forth torn up with huge hunks of flesh uh, ripped out of there. And they had had, of course, by 1941, 23 years to recover. These wounds had occurred in, in War I in Europe. Well, uh, that's only for a little background. <clears throat> I had a chance to get a little better acquainted with uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., because he was the assistant division commander with the rank of brigadier general of the Big Red One, the first infantry division throughout the North African campaign. His commanding general was Terry de la Mesa Allen. He, Allen was the division commander, and uh, Teddy was the uh, assistant division commander, brigadier general. Those two officers, uh, Allen and Roosevelt, did outstanding leadership job with the 1st Division, making it, uh, at least to those of us in the 2nd Corps or in the 1st Division or in the 1st United States Army later on, we were always proud that that was possibly the finest division the United States Army has ever produced, just as the 1st Marine Division uh, could uh, bear possibly a uh, similar uh, notation in the Marine Corps. Thank you, John. <laughs> John, let's get to Sigmund Rhee, if we may. 
Well, during my tour of duty in Tokyo and Yokohama in the general headquarters of the Far East Command, I was called upon to accompany the Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, of the United States government, that would be Harry Truman's uh, Secretary of Defense, his deputy, a person called William C. Foster, not to be confused with William Z. Froster. Uh, and the Deputy Secretary of Defense came to Japan, and I was called upon to escort uh, uh, Secretary Foster throughout the Far East Command. Uh, and uh, this was a marvelous experience in my life. Uh, I find that Mr. Foster, uh, by my judgment, was one of the most distinguished men I ever met. And uh, I was responsible for uh, his uh, 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 tour of the Far East and everything about this uh, in the year 1952. Uh, that was uh, just about the month that the election, that Eisenhower was being elected to be our president, about that time, October and November of 1952. And Mr. Foster had appointments with the president of South Korea, who was Sigmund Rhee. Sigmund Rhee himself is a man of huge distinction in the uh, Korean uh, history. I believe he's a graduate of Columbia University. Uh, I, he's, of course, deceased now for a, a good while. Uh, he had been, in, Sigmund Rhee had been imprisoned by the Japanese uh, <coughs> uh, forces which, uh, uh, which uh, <coughs> uh, held Korea for so many years mm -hmm. between the Korean-Japanese War, which I think was 1907, and uh, uh, from 07 up until the end of War II, uh, <coughs> uh, Korea was under Japanese control. And Sigmund Rhee was imprisoned a good part of that time. His fingernails had been pulled out by the Japanese. I just recall that as one form of his torture. In any event, he was a wonderful patriotic hero of his country. And along with persons like uh, uh, General Van Fleet and General uh, uh, the others leading American Eighth Army, General MacArthur and General uh, Mark Clark, uh, Sigmund Rhee did a great thing as a patriot, saving his country from North Korea. And uh, Mr. Foster uh, went uh, while in Korea, I arranged an appointment for Mr. Foster to meet in the palatial home of the president of uh, South Korea. Now, present besides Mr. Foster and a few staff officers with him and me was President and Mrs. Rhee. Mrs. Rhee is notable in all of this. She is an Austrian woman. There's her husband, a Korean man, and uh, Mrs. Rhee, I don't remember her first name, I wish I did, a very distinguished person. She was from Austria. By this time in his life, Mr. Rhee was a pretty uh, elderly man. I could say aged man. And I think that maybe the relationship between uh, Mrs. Rhee and President Rhee at that time might be to some extent comparable to Nancy Reagan and President Reagan. Uh, the, the sum of that loving relationship, w which also had its professional uh, 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 aspects, was present right there in that room. And I've been able to smile many times since then to think about Mrs. Rhee as the, the Deputy Secretary of Defense of America and the President of Korea are meeting together and uh, Mr. Foster would ask Mr. Rhee a question. Mr. Rhee would answer the question and Mrs. Rhee was never a w more than arm's length away from her husband. And as she poured tea for us guests and so forth, she would never be more than arm's length away. Whenever President Rhee would answer Mr. Foster's question, Mrs. Rhee would say, now, Mr. Foster, I want to be sure you've understand understood the president and what he has said. Whereupon she would repeat what President Rhee had said with minor modification. I couldn't help but feel there's a whole lot of mystery here. I don't really know, don't understand, and it wasn't really my business. Hopefully Mr. Foster did understand it. That's it. That has shades of the last days of Woodrow Wilson, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, you're, you're quite right. You're quite right. Let's uh, take one more name from this list before we begin to um, end what has been a very wonderful session here. You have General Ed Betts. <coughs> well, Brigadier General Betts, uh, he, he was the fellow who uh, arranged my appointment to 
the military academy as a teacher for the cadets on the West Point faculty. Brigadier General Betts, we've not talked about him in this no, before, sir, have we? we? Have not. Um, well, General Edward C. Betts was professor of law at West Point when I was a cadet. And when War II began, and Eisenhower, I mean began in Europe, I, I should say, and Eisenhower uh, began to establish uh, his headquarters on top of the whole Allied forces in uh, Africa and in, uh, in Europe. Uh, he needed, of course, a staff judge advocate, and he plucked uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel, I should say, Colonel Edward C. Betts. He plucked him out of the West Point faculty and took him to Europe to become his staff judge advocate. I don't want to run over the, the Pentagon with all I'm saying here. I, that's my own word that he plucked him out of there. I think probably Ike simply had to ask and he got him. He wanted General Betts to be his principal legal advisor throughout the war. Well, and uh, Betts did uh, fulfill that position through the war and uh, you can well imagine all of the different legal matters that would come to uh, General Eisenhower's uh, responsibility and Betts handled these things for him. I'm thinking especially of things like criminal activities by any American soldier or tort claims against the U.S. Army by the uh, British citizenry or the French citizenry. I won't try to cover all of that, but it's a huge assignment for Betts to have to be Eisenhower's uh, top lawyer. Well, in January of 1946, I was married, as we've mentioned, on the 6th of January to Lieutenant Tova Schwartz, who became Lieutenant, no, she just became Mrs. Ray. Well, in any event, I took the bride. You said did we take a train uh, uh, after the wedding? Yes, we did to Niagara Falls. And uh, that's what you were supposed to do in those days. And pretty soon, <clears throat> I was back at my desk in the Pentagon uh, uh, helping, we've earlier described it as, reduce the army from a huge army to a lesser army. And uh, Tova and I had no place to live or a thing except one uh, uh, fellow officer uh, loaned us our, his apartment for a week or two, which turned out to be a very valuable thing. Uh, we didn't have any government quarters and we had not arranged any rental of quarters. I won't try to explain why, but we had not. And I took Tova out to dinner at the Army-Navy Club at South Capitol and I Street in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. for dinner at the very nice uh, uh, Army-Navy Officers Club in that town. <coughs> We sat down, this might have been about the 15th of January of 46, we sat down at our little table for two, the bride and groom, and lo and behold came down to sit at the next table, General Betts, <coughs> formerly Eisenhower's uh, uh, staff judge advocate, and now apparently he's in the Pentagon, Betts is himself uh, serving in the Judge Advocate General's Department, United States Army. And <coughs> As the Betts sat down at their table, General Mrs. Betts and Tove and I over here, General Betts kind of signaled with his figure, come on over, let me introduce you to my wife. <coughs> so Tove and I stood up, walked over just a few, few feet to General Betts's table, and he said we may as well eat together, and the four of us sat down and ate together. <coughs> After a little while of getting uh, kind of uh, uh, reacquainted, actually better acquainted than I had ever known him uh, any time in my uh, previous uh, service. General Betts says, John, what are you doing? I said, I'm working in the Pentagon. He says, how do you like it? I said, I can't stand it. He said, you should be teaching at West Point. I said, you're right, General. <laughs> he said, you should be teaching law at West Point. I said, if you say so, you're still right. I didn't know he was going to say electricity or mathematics or English or French or Spanish or you name it. You understand, except I could have known because I knew that Betts was interested in the law department. He used to head that. So he said, well, tomorrow morning I'm going to call Charlie West, who was Betts's professor, uh, successor and therefore was then the professor of law at West Point. He said, I'm going to call Charlie West tomorrow morning, Colonel West, I'm going to tell him that you are a candidate for his faculty. You'll hear from him, John. 
And within 48 hours, I did. And within 72 hours, I was at his desk, Charlie West's desk. And the decision was made then and there that I was required, needed, at the military academy. Now, aren't you glad you took your wife out to dinner that <laughs> night, John? <laughs> so that's how Ed Betts happens to fit in there. All right, John, uh, at this point, we generally ask some retrospective questions, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to ask you to think that people are going to be looking at this tape a long time from now, the, your tapes. Is there one thing you might want to say the, to the future of America about your experience and what you've seen, what's been right and what's been wrong, and tell us in just a couple of minutes here now what you think America can profit from uh, from your experiences? Wow. Well, I think I'd like to speak to the young people of Natick in responding to this. Maybe the high school students, junior high school students in Natick. If ever in the future you're planning your own career, be it known, the United States Army is a marvelous career. It offers opportunities of every kind you can imagine to every generation that you can imagine. It will always be to the best of the ability of the men and women in our Army. It will be up to the minute on all of the best techniques, whether they be how human people will deal with each other, be it racial questions, sex questions, will it be the more militar military questions about the dangers in our world and what is required by America to keep the world and more particularly America strong and well. Mm -hmm. There's no better place that a man or a woman can serve. Right here in the town of Natick, we have Natick Army Labs. Go there, get yourself a little acquainted up there and you find just one little facet of what our army does. <coughs> it creates and develops the necessary clothing, equipment, the orange, the frozen orange juice that you all are accustomed to began right here at Natick Army Labs. And I say that <coughs> an army career is a marvelous opportunity and if you want to get your best start on that, see if you can become a cadet at West Point. Young men or women, start yourself there. It's not necessary to go there. An enlisted life in the Army is, is also a very fine life. And don't let people tell you that it's hard and fast and regimented and stiff and strict. The opportunities are endless. Thank you. Thank you, John, very much for coming in.